Please turn to Matthew 9, verse 35 through 38. Then Jesus went about all the cities and villages, teaching in their synagogues, preaching the gospel to the kingdoms, and healing every sickness and every disease among the people. But when he saw the multitudes, he was moved with compassion for them, because they were weary and scattered, like sheep having no shepherd. Then he said to his disciples, The harvest truly is plentiful, but the laborers are few. Therefore, therefore pray the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into his harvest. Dear Lord, thank you for this time to worship you, and thank you for Pastor Pavel and his uh, leadership here uh, so many years and the blessing of this congregation. Please be with his wife and mother-in-law right now as, as they're uh, having some challenges, and be close to them and encourage them. And uh, Lord, as we, uh, as we explore right now the mission of the church, uh, the call to be a movement, not just a denomination, but a movement, uh, and a movement right here in Lexington. Please touch our hearts with your Holy Spirit in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, Jesus says he's the way, the truth, and the life, right? And Jesus tells us, he only speaks truth, that the harvest truly is plentiful, which means the harvest is plentiful in Lexington, Kentucky. Do you believe that? You know, it's very interesting, even though Jesus says the harvest is plentiful, I, I have the opportunity to travel around the world, and I hear people say something like this. So the harvest truly is plentiful everywhere else. Well, maybe it's plentiful in South America or somewhere in Africa. I was just in South Africa there. and uh, In fact, I heard they had a, a meeting. They baptized through a, a series of meetings 100,000 individuals. Isn't that amazing? 100,000 people baptized. And so, uh, you know, we think the harvest is plentiful somewhere else. But what about right here? Maybe we need to change our fish, fishing methods a little bit if we're not reaching the harvest as we should. So I believe when Jesus says the harvest is plentiful, it means right here as well. Now, a number of years ago, um, somebody discovered a quote from Ellen White. Now, Ellen White says a lot. And so somehow uh, we had missed this as Adventist, and nobody at least was talking about it. I suppose maybe somebody read it. But it took a conservative Baptist preacher to bring this quote to our attention. A man by the name of Bob Logan was asked to speak on the topic of church planting, and uh, he uh, came to speak to Adventists at Andrews University, uh, and so he was called to speak on the topic of church planting, and uh, he studied his audience. He wanted to know the context. Who are we as Adventists, right? And so he stood up in front of 400 Adventists, and he said, how many of you here are believers? You think the Adventists are going to raise their hand? You bet. And then he shared this quote right here. He said, Upon all who believe, God has placed a burden of raising up churches. Ellen White said this. Now, does that mean that every one of you is going to be a church planter and lead a church plant? No. Does that mean that all of you are going to go and be a part of a church plant? Well, I hope for some of you that will be part of your journey and experience. But certainly we should not stand in the way of church planting. And sometimes church members will do that. Oh, no, don't plant a church. Well, I'm white saying, if you're a believer, you need to have a passion, a burden for church planting. We need to be fanning that flame. We need to be encouraging that. And so we need to have that burden for church planting. Another quote here is from a, a church plant. Uh, this, this man uh, is actually known as the, the father of the church growth movement. Uh, he is not an Adventist. Um, but his name is Peter Wagner, and he's written a lot in the area of church growth, and he said the single most effective church growth methodology under heaven is planting new churches. Now, that's a very strong statement, isn't it? And I believe, and I hope after we share for a few moments uh, together this afternoon, that you will agree with this statement, and you will recognize that that is an important ingredient. Okay, let's go to the next one here. Um, this is a, a map of the United States. Do you like this map? Really, this is kind of a Texan's view of the world, right? Uh, everything is what in Texas? Bigger in Texas. And in fact, I happen to be born in Fort Worth, Texas. And uh, I can tell you that uh, moving back there to pastor, I was not expecting that. Uh, God called us there. 
and uh, called us there to plant a church. And uh, we, we came to love Texas, and probably if you ask me what's my home state, I'll have to say that it's Texas. But in any case, uh, we'll go ahead and move to the next one here. We were called to plant a church in the city of Plano. Plano is an aff- affluent suburb on the north of Dallas. And, uh, you know, affluence, sometimes we think maybe that's not the most receptive audience. Uh, also, um, there, if we can switch it, um, Plano received an award as being called the safest city in America. How do you like that? Safer than Lexington, anywhere else. Um, so it's not only an affluent place, it's a safe place. And continuing there, Michael, um, many corporate headquarters are found in North Dallas. We have uh, a place, uh, businesses like um, J.C. Penney, McAfee, um, you've got uh, Dr. Pepper. I uh, was one of their clients for a while. I don't recommend it, but um, I travel when I drive long distances. Uh, I get very tired. Um, so fortunately, I'm no longer addicted. I'm not an addictive uh, uh, subscriber to that. But in any case, um, you can see Hewlett Packard and so on. What's a mega church? Thousands of members. In fact, the Prestonwood Baptist Church. 25, 30,000 members, right there where we're going to be planting this church. So on a scale of 1 to 10, how receptive is a community that's affluent, um, that is safe, people are content, they're happy, mega churches with every 200 members they get, they're going to add another pastor. I mean, with all these different specialized ministries. How are we going to do with an Adventist church plan in this community? What do you think? Are they going to be less receptive or more receptive? What do you What's the most likely scenario? We tend to think probably more, less receptive, right? And so uh, this is the kind of uh, thing that I was looking at there. And yet, clearly feeling that God was calling me to plant a church there in North Dallas, in Plano, Texas. So relocating my whole family there. Somehow I got a very strange idea, and I don't know how I got this idea. But I decided to search and see if Ellen White ever said anything about Plano, Texas. What's the chance of that? Did she say anything about Lexington? I don't know. Have you looked it up? Um, you know, it's kind of a little scary almost to look up and see what she, what she say. You know, but anyway, I decided to type in the word Plano, and sure enough, some things came up. And take a look at this. We left them to attend Plano camp meeting held November 12 to 19 in 1878. So the Adventist work started very early in Texas. Notice what she said. The weather was bad. And so she said people from the surrounding areas did not attend. It was people who lived in the immediate area surrounding Plano. Notice what she says about those people. We were highly pleased to find what? A large and intelligent body of brethren on the ground. Where did they go? There's no church in Plano anymore. No avenus there in terms of a, a church presence. She said, my testimony was never received more readily and hardly than by this people. I became deeply interested in the work in the great state of Texas. See, even Ellen White knew Texas was a great state. <laughs> it's inspired. So, can you imagine the impact this has on me, planning to move my family to plant a church? I'm starting to get very excited. Large, intelligent body of brethren, uh, receptive and yet there's no Adventist church. So I'm, I'm sure that the members of the church are going to be just as excited as I am to plant a church there. I found out some other things. Ellen White had her birthday party there in Plano, turned 51 years old. She rode on a lumber wagon pulled by two mules the 18 miles between downtown Dallas. She must have come in on a train to Dallas and then got this lumber wagon and pulled up by two mules to the old part of, of Plano. In fact, my middle daughter works in the old part of Plano, right there where the Adventist meetings were held. That's where she works right now at a restaurant. Nothing was wanting to make us comfortable, she says. Our friends who had recently embraced the truth in Plano had anticipated our wants and liberally supplied for them in the furnishing of our tent. We call that southern hospitality, don't we? Just a little Kentucky Fried Chicken and you got southern hospitality. <laughs> Thirteen people were baptized, and the Texas Conference was actually formed in this place where I'm being called to plant a church. Can you believe it? That's exciting, isn't it? So we have our first elders meeting, and you know this restaurant very well. It's called the Golden Corral Buffet. (laughs) They absolutely kill the vegetables there, don't they? 
I mean, vegetables should still have a little crunch, a little life to them, but they are completely dead. I, I don't like Golden Corral Buffet, and maybe that is the problem with the elders meeting because the food they knew was not going to be the best. But at that elders meeting, we have uh, Elder Parker here. Where's he, where'd he go? I saw him earlier. There you are. Uh, you know, your head elder. So this elders meeting I'm called to, uh, the head elder's there, the senior pastor of the church. I've come to plant the church. I'm enthusiastic, ready to share these Ellen White quotes with them and, and this vision for planting. And none of the other elders show up. And similar to this church, there, you know, there were eight or ten elders in that church. Not one of them showed up. We waited and we waited and we ate much vegetables and we, no, they didn't show up. Something's wrong. What is going on here? What should I do now? Should I pack up my family and just move back, back home? Or what should I do? What would you do? Some say pray. Well, I was already praying, right? I better be praying before I make a move like this. And so I'm already praying. I made two decisions at that moment. And they were monumental decisions in terms, in terms of my own future and the future of that church plant. The first one is I asked the head elder and the, and the senior pastor, I said, could we have the next elders meeting at my house? And can we invite the families to come? Now, as I shared last time I was here, it's very difficult to turn down an invitation to someone's home, isn't it? Uh, a different thing if you say, hey, come to my church. You have evangelistic meetings coming up in a few weeks. Be inviting your colleagues from work, your neighbors, your, your friends that, you, that don't come to this church. Be inviting to them, them to your home for a meal before the meetings happen so that when the meetings happen, you can invite them to come. They will want to hear Pastor Vadim. Uh, it's going to be a powerful meeting. But when we invited the elders and their families to come to our home, they all came. They liked it so much, they said, next month, I'll do it at my house. The following month, I'll do it at my house. So that's how we did elders meetings the whole time I was there. But it gave me an audience. It gave me an opportunity to talk about the issues. What's going on? The other thing I decided to do was to visit all of the elders in their home. So I went driving all over. I found out about Dallas traffic very quickly because I was sitting in traffic a lot. You know, I said, I think I would, you know, I scheduled an appointment thinking I would be there and a half an hour later, I'm still sitting in traffic. But I, I, I was able to get around to the homes and then one of the elders, a very influential man, he'd been at the church since six months after it was founded in 1962. I'm sitting across him from him in his living room and he says these words to me. I don't want to hear another word about church planning. Here I came with all this enthusiasm, all this hopefulness, this eagerness to do something for God, to pioneer a new church plant. I don't want to hear another word about church planting. A bit discouraging, right? But I discovered that established churches like this church right here do not naturally move toward church planting. That's not the natural inclination. And there are a couple reasons for it. Think about it for a moment. What, why might a church hold back from church planting? You know, you had your treasurer here during the first worship service. And he said, we're going to lose some finances, right? We're going to lose some finances if people move. It's hard to meet the church budget sometimes as it is. Now imagine people who are faithful givers to the church budget, they're going to be going somewhere else. Guess where their money goes? It goes with them because they're going to be supporting that new project. So what is the established church going to do to meet their budget? That's one concern that churches have. So let's just look at a couple of others as well. One is the loss of fellowship. If your church has, uh, you know, is functioning well and you get together, you enjoy the community when you come together, thinking about your members moving away is not something you get excited about, okay? And yet if somebody has a job transfer, we celebrate with them, we pray for them, we wish them well, but if they want to go across town on a mission for Jesus, somehow they're abandoning us. They're betraying us. There's something a little bit wrong for, with that, isn't it? And, and I do think when, you know, your pastor's leaving, you'll shed some tears, you're, you're not happy about it, but we are an Advent movement, and you are sending him as a missionary from your church to the general conference, right? This happens in our church. 
it should also happen in our communities, in our cities, to plant churches. We need to be sending our members out as missionaries to start new work. We already talked about the loss of finances. However, research has discovered within 6 to 12 months of a new church starting, the mother church that birthed that church will have the same financial resources or more than they had before. It replenishes in 6 to 12 months. So just have a little reserve set aside and move forward with church planting, knowing that God will bless. The next one here is a loss of ministry leaders. How many of you love nominating committee time in the church? It's your favorite time in the church. You know, this is the strangest thing. We have a committee to nominate the nominating committee. I mean, what kind of a system is that? But, you know, I really never look forward to nominating committee because, you know, sometimes you're just begging people to serve. You know, oh, please, we really need you. And then some, some people take on three or four jobs in the church, right? But here's what happens. When you see people leaving, leaders leaving, you wonder who's going to fill in those positions when they leave. The good news is that God always provides, that people will step forward. What church planting does is actually raises up more leaders, and so it's a very effective way to get more people involved in leadership. Another one here is a lack of a kingdom focus. Do you realize that Lexington is your territory? Not just this area around the church. All of Lexington, you're responsible to see reach for Jesus. You also have a responsibility because that's your Jerusalem, right? Right where you live. Judea is the surrounding areas. Samaria, you have responsible for people groups who live in this area that may not speak English, or may be a, a different demographic. It may be a university students that we talked before. It may be single moms. Um, these, these people groups that we need to be thinking about as well. You have a responsibility for this community to make sure that it's being reached with the Adventist message and with the gospel. And then the final one is some churches are just not healthy. Now, this is not an excuse you can have here because you're a healthy church. We talked about that last time I was here. So... You're a healthy church, so that excuse can't be, can't be given for a reason to not plant a church. So here I've discovered this elder, and it seemed to be the sentiment of all the elders. I don't want to hear another word about church planting. And yet, thanks to our senior pastor and our head elder, on the board meeting agenda at the next board meeting is a report on church planting with my name by it. How do you like that? What do I have to report? Well, the elders don't want anything to do with church planting. <laughs> How's that going to go? Uh, do I report that I'm thinking about relocating my family back to where I've come from? Maybe that's the report I give. But I decide to simply be forthright, to be honest, to be a straight shooter. And Texans like that. They like for you to tell, tell it the way it is. And so I basically, when my time came for the agenda item, I said, friends, I want to let you know that this church is not ready to plant a church. How do you think they responded? Amen! There was resounding enthusiasm in the room. I said, my thought is, let us focus on becoming a healthy church before we even think about church planting. There was another, amen! So that is the process that we began. And we began to work for 16 months. They didn't know how long it would be. I didn't know how long it would be. Preparing to plant that church. And I discovered that despite obstacles, most churches can be led to birthing daughter congregations. The key word is led. And this is what I share with pastors there at the seminary and pastors everywhere I go. If you think church planting is a nice option if you get around to it, you will never plant a church. There are too many resistance factors. You must be convicted that church planting is part of your calling as a pastor. I hope you asked that question when you interviewed your next pastor. I hope you asked that question. It must be part of our calling to plant churches. We are part of a movement. We're not just another denomination. We are a movement, and upon all who believe, all who believe this message, God has placed a burden of raising up churches. Now, if I had pressed forward the church plant when that resistance was, resistance was there, this church would have been inoculated against church planting, right? They wouldn't have wanted anything to do with it in, ever again. But in this case, because we created a climate, an atmosphere in the church 
preparing to plant a church, uh, we were able to reap those rewards now for decades. Uh, from that first church plant now, it's been 17 years. And many, many, many churches have now been planted. It could have been just a single birth, but now it's become almost a multiplication of churches that has started there. There's a Japanese concept that I really like. I, I ran across this and I said, man, this describes perfectly what we did. It's called nimawashi. Nimawashi literally means preparing the soil for something to be transplanted. And so when you have an idea that you want a broad support, you begin to seed that idea and share that idea with key people. Give them an opportunity to think about it, to pray about it in the church planning context. And then when the climate is right, when the atmosphere is right, then you do the transplant. Then you make the big decision. And so that is what we begin to do. We begin to prepare the church, to nimawashi the church, so to speak, preparing for this concept of church planting. And here's what we did. The first step you've already done. We focused on becoming a healthy church. We discovered there were some issues going on in the church that needed to be addressed so the church could, could arrive at a healthy place. The second thing we did is I began preaching, my associate pastors as well, we began preaching about the mission of the church, why we exist. There is not going to be a baptismal tank in heaven. By the way, a very good pastor friend of mine, he, he fills up the baptismal tank sometimes even if there's nobody to baptize. Just to remind people this is why we exist, right? This is why we're here as a church. You will not be holding evangelistic meetings in heaven, sending out handbills. You will not be praying for lost people in heaven. You will not be giving evangelistic Bible studies to anybody in heaven. This is why we exist as a church now. In heaven, we will be fellowshipping, right? We will be enjoying some good music. And the first thing we do is we're going to sit down and have a meal together. So these things are nice that we do as the church, but the reason we exist is the mission that God has called us to. And so I began preaching this. Every passage in scripture I could think of, think about the four lepers who are outside the city. Remember the, the city there is, the, the, the people are starving inside the city. God's people are starving. And these lepers happen upon this abandoned camp. Nobody there. They left all the food, all the clothes, all the, the riches behind. And they're here stuffing their faces with food. And then all of a sudden they stop and say, what we're doing is not good. We must go to, to the city and share this good news to them also. This is good news and we're not to keep it to ourselves. We're called to share it. So preaching, preaching about the mission of the church. Make evangelism the first business of the church. One way we did this is to make evangelism the first agenda item on the board for the board meeting. Challenge you to do that. First agenda item before the, secret before the secretary's report, before the treasurer's report, before the minutes. Evangelism. What are we talking about? What divine appointments did you have this past week? Did you enjoy Michael's presentation during Sabbath school? 30-day challenge, praying every day that God will give us a divine appointment, praying in the morning every day for the next 30 days. If you do that for 30 days, you're going to do that the rest of your life because you will see the difference, the heightened awareness that God will give you. What divine appointments, friends, did God give you this week? And Share those stories in your board meetings you come together. Every ministry of the church makes evangelism the priority. How does evangelism connect with Pathfinders? Are we sending out our kids to connect with other children, to say, hey, come be part of my Pathfinder group. Evangelism, the priority. Create a sense of urgency for reaching those who don't know Christ. We did this by studying the, the demographics. Who's living in Plano that we're not reaching? Who are these people? We did it by making a big deal of baptism, sharing the story of the individuals that were being baptized. By the way, the greatest mot motivation for church members is to see lives changed through the ministry that you're doing. When you see these lives change because of this evangelism effort that you're going to be having with Pastor Vadim, guess what? You're saying, when can we do this next? Sign us up again, right? You know, the number one, I, I had somebody that shared this with me, a philosophy that changed my whole perspective for public meetings, for proclamation evangelism. He said, the measure of a success of a meeting is if the church wants to do it again. How do you like that? If you want to do it again, because it was a great experience. It will ignite your passion when it goes well. The last, uh, another one here, the last one here, is expose influential leaders to church planting. There are people that when they speak here in this church, 
you respect their opinion. And when those members, when those leaders are saying, you know what, we need to, we need to be thinking about church planting. This is something we need to be doing. It, it begins to bring everybody together to say this is something that we need to be involved with. So what were the results after 16 months? We took another church health survey, NCD survey, and our health climbed from a 47, which is below average, up to a 59, which for an established church that's been around a long time is a pretty good score. We still weren't at optimal health. We weren't even as healthy as you are right now as a church. But we were, our momentum was headed in the right direction. It was a good shift for, for 16 months. The second thing that happened here is our attendance went up by 100 people. What impact did that have on us? We already had two worship services. In our second service, we had chairs. Here, see, there's a space for another chair right here, right? We had chairs lined up all the way like that along the church, all the way around the back, and we actually asked our youth that they would sit in the choir loft because our church was completely full. And we, we weren't quite ready to plant a church yet, but we didn't want to stop growing. We actually started offering valet parking and valet parking cars across the streets so that we'd have enough parking. We started putting the video, on the video screen our worship service. We had 50 people in overflow there. All of this not wanting to lose momentum as we're thinking about planting this church. And so God blessed us with church growth as we became healthy. The next thing that we experienced is during that 16 months, we had 60 baptisms. 14 of those from an evangelistic meeting, the rest without a public meeting. God simply was sending people to our church I would make an appeal, a card appeal for baptism. We'd have cards handed out and people just check. I'd put three dates on there. Which date would you like to prepare for baptism for? They select, they select a date. We're gonna have baptism in these three dates. Select the one you'd like to prepare for. 46 baptisms from that. Praise God, so we were growing through baptisms as well. We paid off a debt that the church had. They were really worried about the finances if they planted a church. And so we're able to pay off that $250,000 debt. With cash, we were able to remodel the church and give the church a facelift. So lots of different things happening. At an elders meeting, I remember the one elder, the same elder that said, I don't want to hear another word about church planting, which I will never forget. I also never forget these words he said to me. This will be the first of many church plants that we're going to be involved in. A complete shift in 16 months. So here's what it kind of looked like. We had one church there with 415 people attending when I arrived there. And uh, we began to focus on church planting in this northern corridor of Dallas area there. And when we launched our first church plant, the mother church sent out 90 people to start the church. 90 people. Now, by this time, our attendance was about 550. 90 people went out. to. That's a strong start for a church plant. And uh, yet on the opening Sabbath for the church plant, there were 550 people attending in the new church. How can that happen? The mother church voted to close down on Sabbath morning so they could go and celebrate the birth of their daughter church. Now that's a completely different mentality than we don't want to hear another word about church planting, isn't it? <laughs> Hey, we, we want to do this so much, we want to go celebrate the birth of our daughter. A couple people with flyers, with maps, and, and invitations were in the parking lot just in case anybody hadn't heard the good news yet. And uh, everybody headed up for that celebration. Well, that afternoon, the church plant returned to the mother church and celebrated the mother church being debt-free and the burning of the mortgage. So a very high Sabbath, obviously. The interesting thing is the Sabbath after we planted the church, the parking lot and the sanctuary during second service were still full in the mother church. And the 90 people that we had planted uh, the church with, within a few weeks, because we launched an evangelism meeting and baptized 37 more people in that meeting, immediately jumped about 140 people in attendance. So God was blessing both places, not just the church plant. He was still blessing the mother church for their faithfulness in being a sending congregation. Now take a look at this one. This was a shocker to me. We sent 90 people away, people who were heart and soul of the church, people who were givers financially, sent them away to start the new church, and yet the mother church, those that remained behind, saw a tithe gain of $166,000 the year that the church was planted. 
How is this possible? You see, when we plant churches, it's about God's math. God multiplies. Jesus was able to take five loaves and, and two fish, right? Or was it five fish and two loaves? No, five, five loaves, two. And he was able to feed a whole multitude with it. God multiplies when we're faithful with what we have. And when we send a tithe of our members for his purpose, I think we should send a double tithe, by the way, when we send out. It's 10% of your attendance, 10 to 15%. Even up to 20% of your attendance, you can send out to plant a church, and you'll bounce right back. But we had this huge tithe gain. What happened is one month, I noticed that there was an increase in tithe of $30,000. Now, I just kind of casually paid attention to our finances just to make sure we're on track. I didn't go into it deeply. That's the job of the treasurer and the finance committee. I just want to make sure that we're paying our bills and things are moving forward. But even a pastor will notice when there's a $30,000 increase in tithe. Think of what's going on. Now, maybe it's just an unusual month. Well, the next month, there's also a 30,000 increase in tithe. Third month, 30,000 increase in tithe. So I went to the treasurer. I said, treasurer, I need your help here. What's going on with the tithe? I've noticed it's been up about $30,000 a month. Here we've sent all these people to plant a church and our tithe is up. This does not make sense. He said, pastor, there's an individual that's turning in a tithe check for about $30,000 every month. I said, who is this person? I need to talk with him about local church offerings. <laughs> now, I wanted to meet him. I, I, you know, and, and so he gave me the name. I didn't recognize the name. This is a big church. I, I, I don't even know if I'd ever even seen him. He seemed like he just must have come in and left quickly. I tried to meet everybody and be friendly, but somehow I didn't know who this guy was. So I drove to his address. He wasn't home, but his wife told me that he would contact me, and cer certainly he did, and we were able to have a meal together that week. Of course, he paid for the meal. Isn't that nice? <laughs> but it's after the meal, he said, Pastor, I need to give you my year and tithe check. And he'd already prepared it. He handed me a check, and I looked at it when I got on the car. It made out to the church, of course. It was for $93,000. This one man had brought $180,000 tithe into the church that year in a very short, short period of time. I believe this was God's blessing on us to say you're headed the right direction. And you know what that did at the conference? I called them up. I said, I have a $93,000 tie check, and I think it's a good check based on this guy's track, track record. <laughs> These checks tend to clear the bank. So uh, they were excited. In fact, they said, we need to do this in the whole Texas conference. <laughs> and so after a few years there, I actually was transferred to, to work for the conference office there, and we planted 114 churches in nine years. And by the way, church planting continues in Texas. Last year, they planted 17 churches. The year before, they planted 16 churches. Church planting is a movement in Texas. And I praise God that that will keep going. And it's becoming a movement here in North America. Do you know that on average, we've been planting 80 to 100 churches every year in North America? If Once you look at how many churches closed down, think of them, 17 of those coming from Texas, right? But last year, it was different we planted around 250 churches in North America. And we have a five-year goal to plant 1,000 churches in North America. You can be part of the Plant 1,000 initiative by planting in the next four years, because there's still four years left to that initiative, planting more than one church here in this territory. There's no reason why you cannot do that. We became committed to be a birthing congregation. Certainly that's what happened. You see this initial church there. Now all the church plants surrounding and actually, today, we could add a couple more dots of other churches now that have been planted in that territory as well. So we went from one church with a little over 400 attendants to 11 churches and now counting more, but uh, around 2,000 in attendance. And during a period of time, this is after I left, actually, uh, between 2002 and 2010, while I was planting churches in other parts of the conference, that territory had 1,257 baptisms. Now, church growth experts will tell you that when you baptize 10% of your attendance, so if your attendance here in this church is 300 between both services, you would be baptizing 30 people. That would be a really good result for a year, okay? If you baptize more, even better, right? But 30 would be, a, that should be a goal you would set to plant, baptize that many in a year. The fastest growing division in our world field is which division? South American division, right? 
they baptize about 10% of their membership every year, okay? So if we can baptize in North America at the same rate of the South American division, that's really God's blessing, right? Take a look at this. Our nine-year average in North Dallas was 10.76% uh, of growth rate, of baptism growth rate. The South American division in 2013, their rate was at 10.53%. So in an affluent area in North America, we were baptizing at a rapid pace just like they do in South America. That can happen here. And I want to share with you how that can happen here. There were three components. You already have two of them in place. You're two-thirds of the way there. The first component is you need healthy churches. You're a healthy church because healthy church will pass that healthy DNA to their church plant. And the church plant will be healthy as well. If you're talking about church splitting, that's different. You're not talking about church splitting. You're talking about planting out of health for reproduction purposes, right? So you already have that in place. We had to build that and get that in place because it wasn't there. You're already healthy here. So you've got the first building block in place. The second one is proclamation evangelism, public evangelism. You already believe in that. You're already doing that. You're already supporting that financially. You already have plans in place for that. And in fact, Pastor Vadim loves to have his evangelistic meetings produce church plants. What if you decided, rather than growing your own congregation through, through, the, through his evangelistic meetings, that you, your goal will be to put these new people into a church plant scenario? And some of you will go with them and be a part of a church plant. Wouldn't that be incredible? That can happen. You already have two components. Healthy church, proclamation, evangelism. What component are you missing? Church planting. You simply need to add the church planting component. You put those three together, you will grow like you've never seen before. You will reach more people than you would ever expect to reach. Now, we had some additional impact, and I just want to share this. You have a school here that has how many students? Somebody told me 26. Is that right? 26 students in your school. We also had a school in our church, okay? In fact, some, some individuals in the church, because the church was growing so rapidly, you know, our school didn't have enough space, and they were saying, we need a new school before we plant a church. But one of those influential leaders stood up and said, ladies, I promise you, because the group of ladies that came in, they wanted to put off the church plant. He said, I promise you, we will get you a new school. But right now, we need to plant a church. And so we went forward with church planting. What we did not know is the impact that church planting would have on our church school. We had no idea. A few years after, by the way, uh, there was one gentleman, his wife was teaching Sabbath school when I arrived there at Richardson Church in North Dallas and uh, discovered that she was a Baptist. She'd never been baptized as a Seventh-day Adventist. And so I simply asked her if she'd like to be baptized. And she said, yes, she would. Nobody had ever asked her. So she was baptized, but her husband still was not baptized. When we planted the church, I said, how would you like to be the first baptism for our church plant? He said, I'd like that. Well, a few years after I left, they made him the board chair for the church school that was located at the mother church. Can you imagine that? The guy that's up there in the church plant becomes the chair for the board at the mother church. That's pretty cool, isn't it? But we began planting more and more churches, which means there's more children that need an Adventist school. So all of a sudden, now instead of trying to figure out how they're going to make things work where they're at, they said, you know what, let's buy a facility for our school. And because there's so many children now, they're able to buy a $2.1 million facility and they grow the school to 250 students. Now guess what I've just discovered, what I've just found out. There is a facility, a massive facility, that is for sale for $12 million. All of the churches in that area, including, including the original mother church, they said, let's take our combined tithing and qualify to buy this $12 million facility to put our school on. That facility would enable that school to grow to 1,000 students plus. They're going to be putting three to four of those church plants that don't own their own building yet on the campus of that, build, of that facility so that they'll have their own buildings now too. Unbelievable what can happen. And, and, and the school just plus. I'm looking at this right now. We're going to Australia. And the school that we are at the flagship school for the Adventist Church in North America right now. 
at Andrews University. We have the Ruth Murdoch Elementary, we have Andrews Academy, but if you take Ruth Murdoch and Andrews Academy, you put the attendance together, it's about 400 students between the two schools. Our boys are going to a very secular country, and in that community, the school that they're going to go to, the Adventist school, has 780 students. Can you tell me there's something wrong with the way we're doing schools here? Schools are making money for the church in Australia because they're attracting the community. People, the quality of education is so high, people from the community want to put their kids in the Adventist school. There are 10 schools like that in my conference that I'm going to. What an evangelism opportunity. A lot of the baptisms they have are from their schools. So something, we're, we're missing something, but North Dallas is starting to capture it. They're getting a big vision. They're saying, what could we do with our schools here in this area to reach more kids? And they're growing like crazy because now they have church plants that will help support and populate the school. Um, we can look at a, a, a number of other impacts that, that God blessed, uh, blessed us with there in North Dallas. Uh, here's my uh, contact information. But I want to invite you to come back out this afternoon. Uh, we're going to explore a little further this concept of church planting, how it could be impacting you here in Lexington. I can tell you this. If you want to charge up your spiritual life, get involved in church planting. I have never seen God do more miracles than I've seen than when I'm involved in church planting. It's a miracle. I think there's a book called One Miracle After Another. I think we see one miracle after another when we're involved in church planting. And it's just incredible what God will do. So I want to encourage you to be part of that journey with God, that partnership with God, the adventure with God of church planting.